which they will, through the Recreation website. Thank you, see, added something to the announcements. Anyway, and if you choose to worship by giving this morning, that's a couple of, of ways you can do that. Um, if you are a first time visitor, we are especially glad to have you today. And we invite you to take also on the table out in the hallway, um, one of our visitor packets. Our visitor packets look a whole lot like a mug with a tasty, tasty drink, although now I hear there's two tasty, tasty drinks, as well as some other information in there. 
And if you have not had opportunity to take one of those, I invite you to do so. Um, you will find in there a little bit of information about us and, and who we are and who, who we hope to be with Christ through us and, and, and how we try to serve him and a little bit more information about us. You will find out on that same table some, some little sign-up sheets where we can get a little information about you as well. If you would like to be included in all of our uh, updates and mailings, uh, both electronically and snail mail, uh, out on the table, the little sign-up sheets, that is the way for you to do that. And that'll kind of keep you up to date with what's happening around here. If you have not had opportunity to join a small group, we have small groups meeting directly after this service. Um, we have several right now that are, that are following the study that is we're doing in, in worship as well, which is the way. And if you would like to find a group you can connect with and grow with and fellowship with, we would love to kind of direct you to one that, that you might fit in with. And uh, I would say there, you've got several options. And you can ask anybody up here or out at the uh, welcome desk, and they'll hopefully help you find some place where you will fit in and feel a part. Um, I say book club meets tomorrow night, and we will be reading Kisses from Katie. And uh, that meets at 7 o'clock downstairs, bottom floor of the education building. Uh, next Sunday, RGAs will be sponsoring Muffins for Missions. That means you can, from 8.45 to right up about the time the 11 o'clock service starts, um, go down in the lower, what? Oh, okay, in, in here and the lower, the lower, lower foyer, um, underneath the Muffin Center, I guess, um, you can get some muffins and they're taking donations for our Easter offerings, our missions offering, Benny Armstrong and World Missions, thank you. I knew there was another one. And finally, um, we are in the middle of some very exciting construction things happening around here, and we're getting really close to the end of some of them, and things are starting to, to look really good, and, and, and people are really curious about what's going on and how much is left. But we would ask, if you can possibly hold off, and even if you can't, you really need not to, um, <laughs> that you would not go exploring in the new gym area and other areas that are still under construction because they're not particularly safe and we're, we're ironing out those last minute kinks and we would uh, hate for anything to happen to you or, or the space before it is completed. So if you would refrain from doing that for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's very tempting, I know. But if you, if you absolutely have to see, if you'll find Mitch maybe or, or, or somebody else who's, who's on that committee and construction related to maybe walk you through safely. And we would appreciate that. And we'll leave with that extra little bit of surprise when it's done. <laughs> you went, yay! Anyway, I didn't like yay. <laughs> 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 maybe a little more in my personality these days. <laughs> anyway. No surprise there. Um, we are in observing. We don't really say celebrating. We've been in the middle of um, our, our, our time of Lent. And uh, I wanted this morning to just read you a little parable. It's called The Freezer. It is a parable adapted from the writings of, and with great apologies to Max Lucado. Once upon a time, there was a freezer. This was not just any freezer. This was the Freezer Dine 7000, the crowning glory of all refrigeration. Inside this freezer was a treasure trove of wonderful things, beautiful cakes, juicy steaks, ice cream, soups, vegetables, breads, and seafood just waiting to be used. Did I mention seafood? The seafood's pretty important. Anyway, the Freezer Dine 7000 was a thing of beauty and everyone admired it. Well, one day the freezer became unplugged. It didn't need to get unplugged. It just got really busy. Too busy to notice that the plug was slowly working its way out of its power source. But hey, this was the Freezer 9 7000 with the top energy efficiency around. How much power did it really need? It was pretty powerful on its own. So the Freezer 9 kept going unplugged, never noticing that the wonderful things it held were now becoming rotten. All of that seafood, and meat, and milk products, and vegetables had become one soupy, revolting, 
nausea would be next. One day, the designer got ready to use some of the wonderful things in the freezer bag. He opened it and saw it, and he smelled it. Did I mention the sea thing? Well, the freezer dime, realizing that it was now full of some really smelly stuff, was embarrassed, so the freezer decided to do something about it. He shut that door as fast as he could so the designer couldn't see. Then he got a nice, warm, soapy rag and began to clean himself. He scrubbed his outsides until he shined. He even got a nice wax coat. Surely there was not a prettier freezer in all of refrigeration. However, when he opened his shiny door, he still smelled of rotting seafood and meat. Next, he thought some friends would make things better. So he took his newly polished self and invited all the neighborhood appliances over for a party. They discussed politics and poetry and all things mechanical. The washers dropped the spin cycle and all the appliances danced. The blender really mixed it up. <laughs> it was the party of parties. But when the freezer decided to open his door, the party was over. The other appliances could not get out of there fast enough. Finally, the freezer decided he needed just a little stacks. He earned himself a nice degree in multi-brand refrigerator religions and added a BRR <laughs> to his name. His new status warranted a new wardrobe, so he went shopping at places like Abercrombie and Fridge and made sure he looked really good. He made sure he was seen in all the right places and no one could miss it in his shiny stainless steel convertible. However, in spite of his new status and amazing new wardrobe, he felt empty. Now, he wasn't really empty. He knew he was full of a lot of rotten stuff. You see, hard as he tried, the smell of his interior never really went away. In fact, the more he tried to cover the smell up, the worse it became. It was getting so bad that he could smell it even with his door closed. And worse yet, he didn't know how to fix it. So, out of ideas, he did the only thing he knew to do. He talked to his designer. He opened his doors and let the designer see inside of him. And he let the designer, who had known about the rotten mess all along, do the cleaning. And then the designer filled the freezer with wonderful new things and warned him about the dangers of becoming unplugged. So, clean again, full of the wonderful things the designer had placed in him, the freezer knew he was fulfilling his purpose, and he was happy. In fact, the freezer guy in 7,000 was downright joyful, so joyful he couldn't keep quiet. He told everyone about his new life and his amazing designer, and from that day forward, the freezer guy in 7,000 was watchful, making sure to always remain plugged into his power source. We're observing Lent, and like that freezer, God has placed in us some amazing things, talents and gifts to be used for him. But occasionally, we let a lot of other stuff build up in there as well, things that don't belong there. And Lent is all about recognizing, first of all, who our designer is, and the fact that he is God and we are not and recognizing the fact that he is holy and we are not. And recognizing that there is nothing we can do to clean out the mess inside us, that it's all up to him. And so Lent is that, that time of year that we set aside especially, we should be doing it all year, but we set aside especially to confess to God who he is and the fact that we need him desperately. We come each week to be reminded of who he is and to know that we need him desperately. I'm going to offer up a prayer for all of us. I, take, I, I, I encourage you to take just a moment as I'm praying to pray for those things that may be inside you that you know need taken care of. Our Lord and our God, you are amazing that you look at us and you see all of the rotten mess inside of us, and yet you love us anyway. Not only do you love us, you want to be close to us. You want to take all of those rotten, nasty things, our attitudes, Lord, our anger, our prejudices, 
Lord, those things that we know we should be doing that we're not, and the things that you've told us to do that we just don't. Lord, you've placed in us some pretty amazing things, gifts and talents that we don't use like we should. Lord, even now as we meet this morning, we know that you need to do a work in us. And so, Lord, this morning we confess that we are not who we should be. And we offer ourselves to you. Lord, do the cleaning. Place in us wonderful new things. And Lord, help us to go out and fulfill our purpose of glorifying your name. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for who you are and for the work that you do in us and in the world around us. Lord, help us to become yours completely. In Jesus' name, amen. When we, when we allow Jesus to come into our hearts and to clean us out, much like this fridge, uh, and fill us, with, fill us with that joy, then we, like that fridge, are excited and we want to share the need that God calls us to share that joy and, and, and let it be seen in us. And he also tells us that the world will not understand, but that we're still called to be so joyful. And the joy of God is present even in the Old Testament, much as the embarrassment of, uh, of the world not understanding him sometimes. Um, from 2 Samuel, chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 12. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David was rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fatty calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And we're moving forward to verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, saw, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of, the, of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord, who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Won't you stand with us? Thank you, Jesus.
CD. There's this killer. Youth worship. And we go every Wednesday and praise Jesus. I can't wait to tell my girlfriends about this new guy I met. Jesus. <laughs> he is so awesome. Friday night we had this Bible study. The team across town. We got deep in the word. We can do it again. Next Friday. <laughs> Community 
the, the diseases that they had, the, the things that needed to be healed of, were things that had removed them from community. So therefore, Jesus restores them uh, into community. Today, we're in week three. Week three, and we're going to talk about proclaiming the kingdom. Proclaiming the kingdom, what that looks like. Proclaiming the kingdom of God. And, and we're going to read from Matthew chapter five. Okay, Matthew chapter five, and we're going to we're going to kind of frame the Sermon on the Mount, if you will. We'll start with the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and then we'll we'll give you the conclusion, and we'll kind of give you a summary along the way of everything in between. But here's how it starts. Now, when he saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, All right? That's, that's an introductory comment. Then at the end of it, in chapter 7, verse 24, Matthew 7, verse 24 reads like this. And this is a common story. You've heard it probably before. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Isn't that an interesting statement? You know, sometimes we think that it would have been nice if Jesus had been a little bit more direct. If, if only he had left us, you know, step by step by step, how to get it done specifically with a lot more specifics, he really would have made our lives much easier as Christians. We could just follow a checklist. Yeah, I know he, he did say, love the Lord your God with all that you have and all that you are. That's paraphrased. And, and love your neighbor as yourself. He did give us that, right? But what more specifics, Lord, more specifics? That way there would be less disagreement and less fighting. And religious people fight about something. <laughs> They're going to find something to fight about, whether Jesus had left us specifics or not. We would fight about interpretation of that, you know? So maybe all that's true, but, but in the modern era as we know it, we're used to propositional truth, core principles, arguments that we can support with facts, things that we can back up, you know? And, and we're used to being able to kind of wrap our minds around something, you know? And, and we're encouraged to be skeptical of ideas until we're able to fully understand them. But Jesus was not a 21st century motivational speaker, okay? He was a first century rabbi, and he spoke like one. He used stories, which we normally call parables. Yeah, we had one of the three who died set of thousands of coins. We had a parable. He used parables. He used analogies. He used exaggerated language, which the English teachers will know as hyperbole. That's right. He used all of that. And he talked, he talked about things that our human minds could not even begin to wrap our minds around. And in order to bring some sense to that, he used bridges to, to build ideas and situations so that we could understand that. Here's a bonus passage for you. Go home and look up John 3.12, not 3.16. Go home and look up John 3.12, and you'll begin to get a picture for this whole hyperbole thing. But, but through all of his teaching, Jesus was seeking to help us understand. To help us understand the nature of our relationship with God should be a relationship. A, a personal relationship. Not just a bunch of rules. Not just like the Pharisees promoted. Not like Judaism had degenerated into. Just, just step by step. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And so when Jesus goes to the mountainside, when he goes up on the mountains to teach the people, to deliver what we call the Sermon on the Mount, it's striking that he would choose a mountain setting for delivering the law, the new law, if you will. Why is that? Take it back to the Old Testament. Exodus. Yeah. Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law. God. He went up, and, and, and I, 
Ten Commandments is something I, I think is probably one of the most misunderstood passages in Scripture. I, I like to call them God's ten-step program for successful living. And, and when I say that, I'm not belittling the Ten Commandments. Far from it. Quite the opposite from that. Because I, I want you to understand the intent of the Ten Commandments was not to enslave the children of Israel to more law. you got to understand, these, these children, as the, these people, the children of God, as they came out of Egypt, they had never lived as free people. You ever thought about that one? They had been slaves their entire lives. They had no idea how to live as people who were free. None whatsoever. So these principles, the Ten Commandments, were given to teach people who had been slaves how to live lives of freedom. It would have been a terribly cruel God who would deliver them from bondage to Egypt only to enslave them to the law, right? We misunderstand. We misunderstand. He meant the best for them. But the law, from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, the law had become something that God never meant for it to be. Because human beings, here, religious leaders, human beings have heaped more and more regulations, specific, ridiculous detail to God's given law, which was quite capable of standing on its own. And but they heaped all this stuff onto the law, and in doing so, the religious community had paralyzed their people to the point of wondering if God even cared at all about them personally. And it's into this scene with people doubting if God cared about them personally, that God became personal. Jesus burst into that scene, literally bursting sometimes. You know, and, and I believe the purpose of Jesus' teaching was to help the people understand the kingdom of God, what God desires for us, the relationship that God wants with us. Amen? He desires a personal relationship with every one of us. And God's reign in all of creation is a present reality. It's, it's, it's a present reality. Even though many parts of our world will rebel against it, even though many leaders in our world would have us believe that they are, are God, you know, that, that's just not the way it is. It, it, that's the way it was during Jesus' time. You had rulers who thought they were God. The emperor, the emperor cults, as they call it, the emperor cults actually claimed all temporal and eternal authority. You believe that? All temporal and eternal authority, they claimed it, the emperors claimed it, and they brutally, brutally cracked down on anyone who suggested otherwise. So you think about Jesus' teaching then, it flies in the face, literally, it flies in the face of Judaism, what Judaism had become, but it also flies in the face of the emperor cult, of the empire. And you wonder why he had trouble getting along with some of the leaders. <laughs> he, he literally flew in the face of it. Look at the, the teaching from the from the mountaintop side. Oh, we got the video? Are we there? Okay. Look at this. This video, it, it, it may not be the exact mountain, but these are the mountains around the Sea of Galilee. Okay? And, and it's on one of these mountains that Jesus took the people and he began teaching them. All right? So as you look at those, here are the things he was talking about. He was talking about Beatitudes. Blessed are those. You know those? The Beatitudes? Blessed are those who do this, 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 and this. And, and he talks about salt and light. What it means as believers to be salt and light. Then he talked about his fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. He says this in verse 19. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, get that, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of <laughs> the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the, enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish it. Then he begins to teach them about the spirit of the law. Not the letter of the law, the spirit of the law. He says, this is what you should know about murder. This is what you should know about adultery. This is what you should know about divorce. This is what you should know about oaths and vengeance. And then he begins teaching the disciplines of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, including how to love your enemies. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> how to love your enemies. There. Giving to the needy. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. He talks about the stewardship of 
of our treasure. He talks about, don't worry. Don't worry. God is going to take care of you. He takes care of the flowers and the birds. He's going to take care of you. He talks about not judging other people. And he talks about bearing good fruit. As mature plants bearing good fruit. And then he brings all this to a close. He wraps up all of this teaching by teaching some more foundational truths about the kingdom of God. Literally, he talks about the foundation. All right? Verse 24 of uh, chapter 7, we read it a minute ago. The first word in verse 24 is, therefore. In other words, everything that I've taught, given everything that I've taught you today, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And what was the result? It stayed put. You know, when the storms of life came, it stayed put. Okay? Then in verse 26, he says, But, another transition there, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the result is washed away. Washed away. Now, you got to understand, Jesus was what, my trade? Carpenter. He's a carpenter. He's been raised in a, in a life of carpentry. All right? So he knows a little bit about building, right? <laughs> Let's just go there. He knew a little bit about building. He knew that the alluvial sand that rings the seashore of the Sea of Galilee in the summertime because of the extreme heat was hard as a rock. The surface of the sand was as hard as a rock. But he also knew a wise builder would not be fooled by such surface conditions. See where my analogy is going? Not be fooled by surface <coughs> Conditions. A wise builder would dig down, oftentimes 10 feet below the surface, to the bedrock below, and that's where he would establish the foundation for his house. And when the winter rains came overflowing the banks of the Jordan River there, houses built on the alluvial sand surface would just wash away, become unstable, be worthless. But houses built on the bedrock, they stood. They withstood the flood. Jesus knew the value of a solid foundation. And while the religious establishment of the day advocated sort of a surface righteousness that, that marked an unstable foundation of religious hypocrisy, Jesus gives the bedrock. He says, true life is in the kingdom of heaven. True life is in my kingdom. It will be the unpopular way. It will be the tough way sometimes because people who follow Jesus will be called sometimes out of a life of will be called to stand against the religious establishment. And, and the lesson of his conclusion is that wise people, wise people show that they have carefully viewed the shallow, the surface, the shifting sands of life's teaching and understand it's only through Jesus. It's only through his teaching that he's already laid out for them in heaven. It's through his teaching that you have solid, secure foundation. The wise person thinks ahead. They put their house on solid foundation so when the storms come, and they will come, they'll be secure. In contrast, he says, the foolish person thinks only of the present. The convenient situation, the, uh, the, the gee whiz, the funny part of life, <laughs> you know? They only think about that, the good times. They, they think about that at the risk of building their life on unstable choice really is no less stark in our day than it was in the first century. No matter how smart we think we are, no matter how enlightened we believe we can be, Jesus' words still hold true. And wise men and women build their lives on Jesus, regardless of cultural weather. You see, in his, his words must have run People even of that day recognized the wisdom of his teaching in spite of how they'd been conditioned. How do we know that? When the people had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Not as their teacher. The contrast then was sharper because Jesus was teaching in person with the 
contrast today should be equally as sharp if we're teaching the whole truth of God's word. And depending on the Holy Spirit as we interpret his word in our lives. As pastors and churches that teach God's word, teach Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected, will stand in contrast, understand, will stand in contrast to the shifting sands of our day and for churches and pastors who'd rather be popular than faithful. You know, God's reign, God's kingdom is a possibility that exists for every person who chooses to follow the way of Jesus. That's what he wants to try to teach us. You know, disciples, we play by the rules of God's reign. Even when the powers of the world suggest we follow a different set of rules. Being in harmony with God will most certainly lead us into conflict with the world, but, but his love, it should and it will shine through us. That's what he's talking about, by being salt and light. But God's reign is also a future reality. God's kingdom is a future reality as well. And it will be fully consummated someday. We don't know all the circumstances. We don't know how that's going to play out other than what we have in God's word. It's not for us to know. We trust. We just trust. And we live our lives letting God take care of the rest. You see, until that time that the, the kingdom is fully consummated, we pray for God's guidance. We pray that he will lead us in the way. We pray that he will lead us in his way. We pray that he will lead us on. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, as your children, we have a tendency to wander. We have a tendency to become unplugged from our power source. God, we trust you. We say it with our mouths, but sometimes our lives say it a little bit differently. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us in your way. And as we take the words of Jesus to heart, <coughs> as we seek to live out the example that he gave us, we ask for your power, your strength. Father, we ask for your patience as we demonstrate Christ's love to other people. Recognizing that some of them just won't get it, at least not first time. But we ask that you would continue to use us and allow us to keep our eyes on the end goal. Not on what's temporary, but on the end goal. For it's in Jesus' name we just pray. Amen.